the city of Delhi, where the old and the new coexist. The site of seven capitals from the ancient times to now, this city also reflects the transformation of India and the milestones in its journey. It was at the Delhi Darbar in 1911 that George V, Emperor of India, announced that New Delhi would be his new capital, reflecting British power. But by the time it came up, the British were fast losing power and this city, built in a grand style, became the capital of a free India. New Delhi witnessed the birth of a nation, became a refuge for people, hosted global meets and also witnessed a thousand rallies and protests. If at the start of 1900, Delhi was a forgotten backwater, by 2000, it was a powerful base, fast expanding as new suburbs mushroomed to accommodate new opportunities. But with growth came a host of problems, congestion, unplanned growth and pollution. Today, Delhi is also one of the most polluted cities in the world. In 1947, the population of India was 350 million and by 2022, it had already crossed 1.4 billion. If we compare the urban population, in 1960, there were around 50 million people living in cities and urban areas, whereas today, the number has grown to 350 million, the same as the whole population of India after independence. In this period, cities across India also transformed, with some rising in prominence while others fell. This graph indicates the story of how India's big metros rose, and as they did, they also became more and more congested and polluted, making them increasingly unlivable. According to the Quality of Life Index of Cities 2022, out of the 255 cities sampled across the globe, three of our primary cities, Kolkata, New Delhi and Mumbai, are at lowly ranks. This means that these are among the cities with the lowest quality of life in the world. Go beyond the metros and things look even more bleak. Among the 10 most polluted cities in the world, six are in India. In fact, Bhivari in Rajasthan is one of the most polluted cities of the world. India is also home to the world's most densely populated cities. To understand why our cities are the way they are, we have to go back in time and trace how our cities evolved and how bad planning is at the heart of many of our problems. This has a lot to do with legacy. In the case of the big cities, of course, the British uh, imposed, uh, you know, town planning ideas, uh, which came from, I suppose, the industrializing West. Uh, so it was about zoning. Uh, it was trying to create land use. Uh, it was trying to separate industry. But there was also a layer of, uh, of a kind of political delineation of space, which is separating the white population from what they call the native population. And it was an invisible class because the British city was made in the image of a British city. So it had bandstands and it had grand buildings, uh, you know, for governance, etc., to impose and uh, create symbols of power, so to speak. Uh, and I think Mumbai is a great example of that. Kolkata is a great example of that. And much later, uh, Delhi is an example when it gets situated uh, as a capital city. In the big towns, the British who established planning norms, and that's the legacy in a sense that we have inherited. And it was essentially about control, about rationalizing space and use. Um, but it was incremental, which means that there were no grand master plans. They used what was called the Town Planning Act, where if a piece of land was opened up for development, a plan was made for that piece of land, and it was done incrementally. And then when that land filled up, uh, more land was opened up. Uh, and then, you know, somebody reflected on what was the need at that time. And based on the need, a new plan was done. 
This incremental approach to expansion, experts believe, has been the bane of our cities. But as India became independent, there was a move to go back to the drawing board and build planned cities. In fact, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's government gave great thrust to building new modern cities. The first planned cities in the post-independence era were Bhuvaneshwar and Chandigarh, which came up in 1948 and 1953, respectively. The modern city of Bhuvaneshwar was designed by German architect Otto Konisberger and Chandigarh's planning was done by French architect Charles Edward Le Corbusier. They embodied Western paradigms in design like zoning and creating land use. Influenced by the industrial towns in the Soviet Union, Nehru and his government also pushed the idea of developing cities centered around the heavy industries that were being set up. So you had the Steel Authority of India's industrial townships of Bhilai in Chhattisgarh, Durgapur in West Bengal and Bokaro in Jharkhand. I think it's well known that Nehru was very inspired by what happened in the, the Soviet Union and, uh, and that he had, a, of course, a very, very strong influence on developments in India following independence. Uh, so there was also this idea of exploiting natural resources for the public good, which you, which, you know, relates back to the experience in the, in the Soviet Union. But it also dated back to the, the Cité Industrial by uh, Charles Garnier, who's one of the first uh, people to envision uh, the kind of ideal industrial town, it introduced the idea of zoning, uh, separation of industrial facilities and living areas. And, uh, and then there were also planning models like the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was also implemented in a number of circumstances in India, including uh, the Damodar and Mahamadi uh, River basins. Bilai and Bokar were also both planned with Soviet development aid around the operation of steel plants. And um, even other towns like Orkela and Durgapur, for example, they were built with aid agreements from Germany and British and, and from uh, the UK. Uh, and, but they also still largely followed a similar approach. While the industrial towns grew in keeping with the growth of the central plants that they were centered around, the new cities planned on the Western urbanization model, like Chandigarh and Bhuvaneshwar, began to face challenges soon enough. I think it's. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with the rigidity of planning models at that time. I mean, I think that that approach to planning has changed not just in India but you know, in the United States as well. I think there's a much more kind of uh, soft touch to to planning and development uh, in the 21st century. I think that that um, really comes from the realization that that the kind of existing conditions of a given place are very, very important in how you, how you change it and, and improve it. And, and you know, like, as I've said before, one of, one of the biggest criticisms of the uh, places like uh, Bilai and Chandigarh was the way that they really, really imposed something radically different without taking into account what was already there. Over the decades after independence, the concentration of economic opportunity in a few cities has skewed growth, and it is in some of these rapidly growing cities that we face the biggest problems. Let's take the case study of Navi Mumbai, which was intended to be a twin city to Mumbai. Within the first 20 years of independence, as cities like Mumbai grew rapidly, a need was felt to introduce a planned expansion. In 1964, Architects Charles Correa and Shirish Patel proposed the expansion of the city of Mumbai eastwards. In a city that stretched along a line south to north, this was a bid to accommodate the growing population of the city and ease congestion. Well, it seemed obvious in 1964, there were three momentous happenings across the harbour to east of Mumbai. One was that a number of industries had come up in the Thane Belapur region. Uh, that's a strip on the mainland on the eastern side of Thane Creek. The second uh, happening was that the old Mumbai Harbour could not cope with the deeper draft needed by more modern vessels, which were coming into vogue. Uh, these vessels would need much deeper waters 
and these could be had at Navasheva, halfway up the Thana Creek on the eastern uh, mainland side. And the third happening was that the Thana Creek road bridge was under construction, uh, nearing completion. It would connect Chembur and Trambe on the eastern edge of Mumbai with the mainland to its east, and beyond that to the Thana Belapur belt, Panvel, and the mainland generally. With these three initiatives already in place, it was obvious that whether you liked it or not, the city would grow eastwards. If that eastwards growth was going to happen anyway, we said, why not make it a planned development rather than the chaotic, uh, the chaotic time kind of growth we saw in the refugee and migrant settlements in Ulasnagar and so on. In an article in the Mark magazine, the duo proposed a new suburb. What was proposed was a new township in the area we now know as Navi Mumbai or New Mumbai. This was a region that covers the present-day Thane Belapur strip, which includes areas like Airoli, Vashi, CBD Belapur and Khargar, located on the eastern end of the Thane Creek. Within this stretch, Belapur was envisaged as a well-planned office and commercial hub and so-called CBD Belapur or the Central Business District of Belapur. This would be serviced with great infrastructure and residential areas around to accommodate people of different economic groups. This twin city was intended to free up Mumbai's original commercial hub at Nariman Point. Based on the plan first proposed by Korea and Shirish Patel, the development of a twin city to Mumbai across the harbour was proposed in 1970. It took nearly a decade for the plan for Navi Mumbai, as the project was called, to get state approval and another decade for the Navi Mumbai Municipal Corporation to be set up. But from the start, it was clear that the Twin City, an alternative to Mumbai's commercial heart, would be a tough one to pull through. While critical links to make Belapur accessible, like the Vashi Bridge over the Thane Creek by road came up in 1973, the first real construction between the cities was established only in 1992-93. The second road link between Mumbai and Belapur, the Airoli Bridge, took another seven years to build. Meanwhile, another critical link that had been proposed in the early years of planning, the Mumbai Trans Harbour Link or the Sivri Navasheva Link has been marred by decades of delays. The latest promise is that it will be completed by October 2023. While India's central bank, the RBI and major government-owned entities like PSBs like SBI and Punjab National Bank moved some of their offices to Belapur in the 1980s, it ultimately failed to attract companies and hence never really became the financial hub it was supposed to be like Nariman Point or the Bandra Kurla complex which came up much later. There were a lot of forces, it seems, which didn't want the project to succeed. We tried very hard to sell the idea of government shifting its base from the fort area to New Bombay. We said that an example of this being done already existed in the country. 50 years ago, the capital was shifted to New Delhi with all the advantages of a new planned city. Uh, in fact, imagine if the capital had continued to be in Old Delhi. Uh, why couldn't what was done in New Delhi be also done for Bombay? MLAs would have bungalows to live in rather than flats in a multi story building. A shift of government's location would also be the most powerful stimulus uh, and uh, incentive possible uh, and much more development uh, in New Bombay would follow. This was not only not accepted, uh, I don't know why, I think maybe there was a fear that if government and therefore the capital of Maharashtra was shifted to New Bombay, the old city would be made uh, Union territory. It's possible that that was a, a reason for not shifting government. But much worse was the, uh, much worse than the refusal to move government was the active promotion of new development at the southernmost tip of the old city. This is the most difficult part of the city to reach. Here we were 
trying to attract the city's growth to New Bombay. And there was the government actively selling coordinates in the sea at Nariman Point, the least accessible and therefore the worst possible location in the old city for promotion of growth. Fortunately, we were able to stop it before it went too far with the help of a successful writ petition, which uh, got the, the uh, judgment that the further plots at Nariman Point could not be allocated. They had to be sold by auction. Of course, they didn't want it to work. <laughs> the lands uh, in New Bombay were owned by um, uh, the government. The lands the builders owned were in the old city. They owned nothing to the east. That had been taken over by Sinco. By discouraging eastward expansion, land in the old city could be kept in short supply. Um, especially encouraged by the development of large tracts in the old city as no development zones. Uh, usable land kept in short supply meant that there would be dizzying profits for zero effort. If Navi Mumbai had come up as it was envisaged, Mumbai would have been a very different city today. Instead, the city of over 20 million people suffers an ironic predicament. Manhattan, which is about the same size as the island city, has 21 bridges and 15 tunnels that connect Manhattan to the mainland on either side. Mumbai has the Thana Creek Bridge, uh, road and rail. It has the Airoli Bridge, road only. And then to the north, of course, there's the Western Railway and the Central Railway and uh, roads accordingly. But the eastward connection is these three bridges. Manhattan has 21 bridges and 15 tunnels. Obviously, the eastward expansion is not wanted. The story of CBD Belapur and the failed planning around it reverberates elsewhere across the urban landscape of India. But there was an early attempt to make a watertight plan to be one step ahead of growth in our cities. In 1984, Rajiv Gandhi uh, appoints for the first time in India a National Commission on Urbanization to look at what uh, what urbanization means in India and how we can take our cities more seriously because people were calling them the generators of the economy. And so this commission was a very interesting commission in terms of its composition. Uh, it, was, uh, it was chaired by Charles Correa, so it's often referred to as a Correa Commission. And the vice chairman of this commission was someone called M.N. Butch. M.N. Butch was one of the most respected IAS officers uh, from the, uh, the Madhya Pradesh cadre based in Bhopal, and also very interested in urbanization. And then it had a range of other experts all the way from um, you know, Xerxes Desai, he was an administrative officer, but with experience in cities and managing cities, he had been involved in New Bombay. It also had people like Kirti Shah, uh, who was involved with low cost housing. He had someone like Cyrus Gazdar on it, who was at that time with Bombay Environmental Action Group, uh, very involved in the heritage movement in Mumbai. It for the first time brought voices on urban conservation, on low cost housing, on bigger imaginations of the city. And and this was really, really a seminal piece of work, uh, which somehow, just because of the political situation uh, and because we were so close to liberalization, uh, suddenly went into storage. And what's interesting is that this was the first time such a comprehensive overview on urbanization was taken. And so the sections that they covered, and I'm just going to read out a few as an example, are uh, what are the dimensions of urbanization? They looked at urban futures. They looked at what spatial planning would mean. So how planning doesn't just stay abstract in terms of numbers, but how you can spatialize what those projections could be. They had a whole section on urban poverty, land as a resource, financing land, urban management. Uh, they had a whole section on urban form, which is urban design, conservation, housing. That is, what is the shape the city could take. Then they had a whole section on infrastructure, on water, on transportation, on energy systems. 
Then they had a whole section on how people could participate in this process. Now, how could you go down to those Mohalla community, uh, committees? How could people's voices be fed into the system? How do you create an information system? How do you create a legal framework? So it went through a real gamut of things in trying to explain uh, what urbanization in India would mean. In the National Commission of Urbanization's report, there were just many jewels and there were many things that uh, perhaps need to be seriously revisited. But what was interesting was for the first time, uh, the commission created an imaginary of urban India, which was beyond looking at the primary and secondary cities in that simplistic way. But it actually complicated the reading uh, by looking at you know, historic processes, where were investments made, what was what is what drove the primary city so it, it basically created a, a much more complicated landscape in understanding this so there were two or three concepts that that emerged which were very very beautiful but very potent also and one of it was that you know they kind of made a roster on an inventory of 600 cities in india that they thought that needed attention and then from that they kind of created this wonderful category which was called gems you know it as it implies like jewels gems and gems stood for the generators of economic momentum and they recognized some cities that they felt could really generate the economy of the country which is either they were mandi towns that bought produce from the hinterlands for distribution rather than everything going to bombay or going to another primary city so how you could get this kind of disaggregated imaginary uh, of, of of india they created also a reading of what they call agri-climatic zones, where they said there were certain zones where agriculture flourished and you needed to look at urbanization uh, differently. They were called agro-climatic uh, regions. Uh, and, um, and they found, I think, 80 natural regions that could be defined as regions, uh, which should have a particular kind of attention that brings the synergy of the resources uh, that uh, exist there. And then they, uh, within that, they had 49 spurs and spurs stood for spatial priority urbanization regions. And these were of course of different sizes. But so, so basically what they did was they created a hierarchy within the 600 cities that they identified. And essentially they argued that each of these categories needed different approaches for planning. Uh, and I think that is very important because what we, what we inherited from the British in a way is a kind of tendency to universalize, right, for the ease of administration. So you had a blanket imagination of what the city would be like. And so I think the National Commission, by introducing the voice of conservation, by introducing the voice of low cost housing, by creating categories of the spurs, of the gems, which were cities that had different kinds of potentials and needed planning all the way down to urban form and housing to be different for those needs was a way of, of, of decentralizing, of disaggregating, of regionalizing what planning could be. But I think the politics in the country in the late 18, 1980s, moving into the 1990s was a shift to complete privatization and the state just moved back. And this report was just on the storage shelf uh, you know, of our libraries. Sadly, the recommendations of the commission were never taken up. Political upheavals and economic crisis that led to the opening up of the Indian economy, liberalization took precedence. The report of the National Commission on Urbanization went into cold storage. The post-liberalization period, the last three decades, has also thrown up new challenges. So one of the things when we look at India's urbanization trajectory and we look at the evolution of cities is what begins to happen when we liberalize our economy. And when we liberalize our economy in 1992, uh, we have a decade where uh, the state completely absolves itself of any uh, involvement with planning and private sector is tentative because it doesn't know quite what to do. So what private sector does is it begins to buy land uh, and urbanize it. And it's a very interesting trend I observed in the late 1990s, 2000s, where uh, 
you know, for the first time, because of the liberalization of our economy, that you could convert agricultural land quite easily into urbanizable land. And people were accumulating land like in the middle of nowhere, halfway between Bombay and Pune, and big corporations, et cetera, because they suddenly felt this as an opportunity where, because of liberalization, they could buy a big piece of land, thousands of acres. They could get some fancy consultant from America or Europe to make a master plan, go to the government, get a stamp that the land has now become urban land from agriculture land, because that was an impossible thing to do uh, before the 1990s. And so there are many, 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 many plans prepared for all sorts of townships all over India, which is just land. It was a way that these corporations invested in land as an asset, which is pathetic because it's just about greed. It's not about trying to create a, a place where society could thrive, right? And so this was, I think, emblematic in a sense of what happened with liberalization without the government setting the terms of what their role would be and what would be the role of private enterprise. Now, when we liberalized and embraced what is neoliberalism, which is where the state absolves itself of delivery on many of these things, you began to get global capital arriving. Now, capital is intrinsically impatient uh, because it needs to realize its value very quickly. And that's why the cities we stupidly celebrate today are Dubai and Shanghai and Singapore, because these create the realization of the value of capital without any friction, right? So they celebrate, come and you know, deliver here. So, uh, come and invest here and you know we will take out all the blocks in the process for you which is what our governments also do they say we want to make x city a global city which essentially means that bring capital in and let capital do what it wants and it's very disruptive for the city because you begin to get these bizarre images of globalization or global capital which is an illusion. It's only an illusion of competency because at the base of those buildings, you yet see slums, right? There is no holistic planning. So I think the problem in this liberalized period has been we haven't had an armature. We haven't had a framework. We haven't had a broader imaginary in which private enterprise uh, could um, actually operate. And I think the time has come where we have to recalibrate this. We have to recalibrate our priorities. Governments have to say what is the real need of the city, which is housing, basic infrastructure. And that's why the smart cities mission is such a ridiculous idea because what smart cities implies is how you can use digital technologies to network different domains in a city to create efficiencies. But if those domains don't exist, if there's no water supply, there's no energy, there's no housing, what domains are you even networking, right? And that's why, you know, within the National Commission of Urbanization and what emerged as the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission was a much more accurate definition. It wasn't sexy, but it was a much more accurate definition of what the problems of urban India were. And I think we have to wake up uh, to this condition and this situation if we have to address the real problems. Otherwise, we are creating an illusion of you know, cities that are part of a global network, cities that are efficient, cities that are modern, cities that are world class, uh, which it, these are hollow, hollow, hollow categories. Uh, and the reality uh, in India is quite different and in urban India is even more different. Today in cities like Mumbai, millions face the brunt of bad planning, poor infrastructure, patchy growth, and a widening chasm between people of different income groups have made cities like this increasingly congested, polluted, and unlivable. Over this series on the making of our cities, we will look at some of the key areas of concern, lack of adequate housing and amenities, poor governance, the damage we have done to our environment, and the tough road we face ahead.